Hello students, in this video we'll discuss Cayley's linear fractional transformation, which is a transformation that maps the upper half space onto the unit disk, which is a very valuable tool in studying conformal mappings. So let's recall the family of LFTs, S of Z, which are Z minus Z3 over z minus z4 over z2 minus z3 over z2 minus z4 map three distinct points of the Riemann sphere to the following points. Two, S of, if I plug in, for example, if we plug in Z2, we go to 1. If we plug in Z3, we go to 0. And if we plug in Z4, we go to infinity, right? And so in particular, I'm really interested in one case. I'm interested in the case when Z2 is equal to infinity, when Z3 is equal to i, and z4 is equal to negative i, right? So what's the line? Uh, well, in some sense, now that's going to, those three points, what, are on a line. What line are they on? They're on the imaginary axis, right? So these points are on the imaginary axis. Right? And of course, if z2 is equal to infinity, this term in the denominator just tends to 1, right? And so your mapping over here is going to be called c of z, and it's going to be z minus i over z plus i, okay? And so let's do some properties of this Cayley mapping over here. So it's called the Cayley mapping. Very important, so this mapping, this LFT, is called Cayley's LFT. And it's oftentimes a very, very useful building block, right? Because we want to think of this as, and what's the, what's, why is the building block? In Cayley's LFT, so C, C is a mapping from the upper half space to the unit disk. So here H is a set of Z such that the imaginary part of Z such that the imaginary part of Z is greater than zero. And of course, D is our unit disk z such that modulus of z is less than 1. Okay, Good. All right, so how do we see this over here? So what do we need to show? We need to show that if z is an h, so let's do, it, let's do it two ways, OK? So two ways, proof. There's a geometric way of doing this. So if we have the upper half space over here, so if this is our upper half space, Then where does I reside? And here's the bottom part of that. So negative I is over here. And then positive I is up here. Right? Positive I is up here. Now let's suppose that Z is in the upper half space. If Z is in the upper half space, that means Z is somewhere over here. Okay? That means that's where I is, and that's where Z is, right? Now, just at least from this picture. That's the what? That number over here is the length of z minus i. So that's z minus i in modulus. Okay. And then down over here, this point over here, this length over here, is what? Is z plus i in modulus over here, right? So at least from this configuration, what's it clear? From this configuration, it's clear that the modulus of z minus i is actually smaller than the modulus of what? z plus i. And this is exactly equivalent to what? This is exactly equivalent to modulus of z minus i over modulus of z plus i less than 1. And this, of course, is equivalent to saying that from this configuration, now this is not a rigorous proof, but it should be clear geometrically, right? And of course, LFTs are all about geometry, right? So if you can get a good, ge so I drew this picture so that you can get a good sense of how you can try to prove geometric properties using LFTs, okay? And z is in D, like that. Excellent. So in other words, if Z is an H, then C of Z, that's C of Z actually, so let's make that a little more clear. I didn't mean to say Z is in D. That's, that's nonsensical, but we want to say that Z, C Z, 
is in D. That's the analytic proof of that fact. Good. All right. And so now what's going to happen over here? So now what's the, what's the analytic proof of this fact, right? And so, of course, what's the modulus? So, of course, the modulus, so let's suppose that z is an h, which says that z is equal to x plus i y with y greater than 0. And so then what's the modulus of um, z minus i? z minus i over modulus of z plus i is going to be what? is going to be, um, well, let's see, we're going to have an x, right? So that's going to be uh, square root of x squared, right? That's going to be the x term. Let me square both these things to get rid of the square root, right? And I can show that it's still less than 1. So no square roots necessary. And now I'm going to have an x squared, because that's the real part. And then plus, I have a um, plus what? Plus a y minus 1, y minus 1 squared over what? Over x squared plus y plus 1 squared over here, right? And now, of course, everything is the same. The numerator is going to be what, though? So this is equal to, let's leave that alone. I need some space for a drawing over here. This is equal to x squared plus y squared, and then minus 2y plus 1 over x squared plus y squared plus 2y plus 1, right? Everything's the same except what? This number over here is negative, negative, and this number over here is what? Positive, because y is positive because you're in the upper half space, which says that the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So I have a small number over a large number. That means that that thing is less than what? Is less than 1. And that proves that this quantity is in the unit disk. So for this value of z, so if z is an h again, so if we have z is an h, this argument over here analytically implies that cz is in d, right? Excellent. And now the cool thing is that the, the, what happens to the geometry, right? So remember that LFTs map lines and circles, lines and circles. So I'm going to draw a picture over here. So so here's the upper half space. That's I, R. Here's R. And then what's going to happen is the Cayley map takes the real axis to what? It takes the real axis to the unit circle, right? So the real axis is going to go to the unit circle. That's easy to see, right? Because where does 0 go? So 0 is going to go to negative 1. So 0 gets mapped to negative 1. That's I, R, and that's R. And we're going down from here to here via the Cayley map, right? So 0 is going to go to what? So I plug in into the Cayley map. If we plug in um, z equals 0, we get negative i over, ne over i. That's a negative 1. So 0 maps to negative 1. And then what is, um, what's 1 going to map to? Let's figure out what 1 maps to. So what's 1 minus i over 1 plus i? 1 minus i over 1 minus i. So that's going to be a what? That's going to give me a, um, let's see, the denominator is going to be a 2, right? Over what? A 1 uh, over a 2, right? Let's be careful about this. So, yeah, because the distance from 1 to i, if I plug in 1 to this, the distance from 1 to i and the distance from 1 to negative i is the same. So that's going to be equal to 2 over 2, right? So that makes sense analytically. 2i. Uh, let's make sure we're doing this correctly. So I have a 1. So where does 1 go? 1 should go to i, right? So I have a 1, and then minus 2i, and then negative i, negative i, and positive i. So that's going to be a 2i. So that goes to i. Good. OK, so that goes to i. 1 goes to i over here. Excellent. And then finally, where does negative 1 go? So negative 1 should also go somewhere else nice. Or where does infinity go, right? Infinity goes to what? Infinity goes over here to positive 1, right? Infinity goes to positive 1. So those points are concyclic, right? And so they just go, So the, the real line gets mapped over here to the unit circle, right? Beautiful. OK, so the real line gets mapped to the unit circle. Now, for example, where does a line go like this? If I looked at just the line, the vertical line i, y equals i, for example, the imaginary part equals i, that's going to go to a circle that looks like this. So if I plug in all the points equal to i, well, if y is equal to i, it's possible if y is equal to i that you can get a 0 up here, right? So in other words, you have to go through the origin, so the circle looks like this. has to fix one. And all of the circles that all other lines over here, the small ones, 
like this, the small imaginary parts map to larger and larger circles, right? But they all foliate in this manner over here. If we go to something larger over here like this, larger imaginary parts go to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller circles. So you get this nested family of circles that go like this. So you have this beautiful geometric structure over here. And so what's happening is that all of these circles share a common tangent. They share a common tangent over here at the point, um, at the point one, right? And the point where the real part of z at this point over here, real part of z is equal to one. So you get these, all these families that have the same tangent. And so what's happening now is you, if you, you can sort of see what we can do with this Cayley, uh, this Cayley LFT. We're able to actually take these circles over here. If you have a geometric problem that involves circles that share a common tangent at a point with shrinking radii, right, whose centers are being shifted down an axis, you can change that problem into what? Into a problem about parallel lines in the upper half space. So I'm able to take geometry problems over here in the, with all these circles whose tangent at the point when x is equal to one and map them to straight horizontal lines in the complex plane. So via this transformation, this conformal transformation, I'm able to actually understand prop geometric properties over here by understanding simpler properties over here. We're going to see in further videos how I can solve really cool geometry problems by making allusions to what LFTs do to, to families of circles and family of lines. Thank you very much.